so this week we are looking at chapters 17 to 20. Next week we will finish the novel by looking at chapters 21 to 24, and then I will introduce the final exam. After the end of class next week, the exam will begin and you will have one week to answer the questions. For week 18, we have a bonus week. Uh, and I thought, you know, it's not part of the final exam. It's a bonus week. So uh, why don't I use Chinese to teach week 18? What do you think? Uh, right, so I want to make sure that you all can in fact understand Chinese. If you cannot understand Chinese, please tell me. Okay, so this week we're looking at 17 to 20. One, how would you describe Mrs. Smith? What do you think Anne admires so much in her? Two, Mrs. Smith argues for the value of what some call gossip. Do you agree? Why or why not? Three, do you think Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot makes sense? Why or why not? Four, Anne believes that Louisa's fall will affect almost every aspect of her life. Do you agree? Why or why not? And five, Anne believes that Captain Wentworth must still love her. Do you agree? Why or why not? And can you give evidence for your answer? So let's start with one. Mrs. Smith. So uh, Mrs. Smith is Anne's poor invalid friend. And in their childhoods, before she became Mrs. Smith, she was called Miss Hamilton. In their childhoods at school, Miss Hamilton had taken care of Anne, who at the time was very unhappy because her mother had just died. So they formed a childhood friendship. Now, she was a widow and poor. Her husband had been extravagant and such and at his death about two years before, had left his affairs dreadfully involved. Involved means that there are still many connections that have not been resolved. So he owes people money, basically. And Mrs. Smith was also afflicted with a severe rheumatic fever. Guan uh, Yin. Rheumatism, Guan Jie Yin. Uh, this is the old name. Today we call this arthritis. Uh, which finally settling in her legs had made her for the present a cripple. So she can't walk. Today we don't use the word cripple. We don't use the word invalid either. We use the word disabled. A disabled person. Uh, and so that's why Mrs. Smith is in Bath. Apparently the hot springs in Bath are supposed to have medical properties, like they can help heal people. But she's so poor that she cannot even afford a servant. And so she is excluded from society. She can't go to parties. Nobody comes to talk to her. Um, so Anne goes to visit. And it's been so long that at first it was kind of awkward. But 
soon they got along well again. Anne found in Mrs. Smith the good sense and agreeable manners which she had almost ventured to depend on. So this is something that she felt Mrs. Smith must have. Based on how she was as a kid, she must have these good um, attributes. And Mrs. Smith has a disposition, qingxiang, or was a gexing, to converse and be cheerful beyond her expectation. To converse just means to chat, to have a conversation. So even though Mrs. Smith is poor, widowed, and uh, is disabled, she's still happy. Neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. Uh, and then the next paragraph explains more. Mrs. Smith had been very fond of her husband, so she loved her husband very much. To be fond of means to like. She had buried him. She had been used to affluence, which means wealth and money. It was gone. She had no child to connect her with life and happiness. Remember in chapter one, we talked about Lady Elliot, Anne's mother, and it said that her children and her duties as a wife had made her attached to life. This is something similar. So here Mrs. Smith has no children to connect her with life. She had no relations, no family members to assist in the arrangement of perplexed affairs. Perplexed here does not mean confused. Uh, or I guess it does mean confused in the older meaning, which means mixed up. So her affairs or her business has been mixed up together. It's very complicated. But she has no family to help her. And she has no health to make all the rest supportable. The idea is as long as you're healthy, there's nothing that cannot be overcome. You can do anything with enough time and energy. But Mrs. Smith is not healthy. She lives in a poor place. She cannot move without help. And she only shares one servant with the entire house. And yet. Um, Mrs. Smith still was kept busy and was happy. How could it be? Anne finally decided that this was not a case of fortitude or, or of resignation only. So it's not simply because Mrs. Smith is a strong person. It was the choicest gift of heaven. So the only way that Mrs. Smith could still be so happy in her situation is because she has been blessed by heaven. To have that kind of personality. So question one, how would you describe her? Why does Anne admire her so much? We could describe Mrs. Smith as extremely optimistic. Like everyone's life has good parts and bad parts. Mrs. Smith somehow is able to focus on the very small good parts in her life and to mostly ignore the many big bad parts. Uh, and this is, of course, what Anne admires about her. But why do you think this is so important for Anne? Well, notice how Mrs. Smith expresses her joy. It says that she. Uh, let's see. Where was it? It said that she conversed. And was cheerful. Mm. 
can't find it. I just read it. So the idea is that Mrs. Smith is not just here we go. A disposition to converse and be cheerful. So Mrs. Smith is not only happy. She expresses that happiness by talking with people. Uh, in this case with Anne. She still loves to talk. She has good spirits. And if we remember from last week, Anne told Mr. Elliot that rather than important people, she would rather spend time with people who had intelligence, knowledge, and could hold a good conversation. So Mrs. Smith, suffering so much, can still have a lively conversation. This is something that Anne cares about very much. And in the example of Mrs. Smith, we can understand why Anne cares about conversation. Because being able to have a good conversation reflects a good mind and a good attitude, a good spirit. This is exactly what Mrs. Smith has. Her mind had not been ruined by her sorrow. She still had good spirits and therefore she still enjoyed talking with people. These are all things that Anne cares about. OK, questions for one. All right, two. Gossip. In Chinese, we usually call this bagua. Uh, it starts on page 102. Um, so the nurse that she shares with the entire building is not just someone who takes care of her. She is a nurse by profession. She is a professional nurse. And she works not just here, but elsewhere also. Um, let's see, where does it say? So because she's a nurse, she works as a nurse. Uh, she also works as a nurse for other people in the neighborhood, usually poor families. So she knows a lot of people professionally. And then Mrs. Smith says, everybody's heart is open. Uh, and Nurse Rook, her nurse, thoroughly understands when to speak. She is a shrewd, which means clever, smart, intelligent, sensible woman. Hers is a line for seeing human nature. This means her line of work, her job, lets her see human nature. And she has a fund of good sense and observation, which means she has a lot of good sense and observation. A fund is money that you save up, so it's a lot. That's just what this means. Uh, Nurse Rook has a lot of good sense and a uh, sense of observation, your guan cha li, which as a companion make her infinitely superior to thousands of those who having only received the best education in the world know nothing worth attending to. So Mrs. Smith is saying that her nurse knows uh, she has good sense and she has a good observation. This makes her much better than everybody who only has what people call the best education in the world. But they don't really know anything worth knowing. And Mrs. Smith continues. Call it gossip if you will. So if you want, you can call it gossip. But when Nurse Rook has half an hour's leisure to bestow on me, 
So if she can stay another half hour to chat with me. Leisure means rest, so relaxation. Uh, I, here it, it means talking. To bestow on means to give. So when she has half an hour of rest to give me and we talk, she is sure to have something to relate, which means to tell. That is entertaining and profitable, so it's both fun and you can learn something from it. Here profitable does not mean money. It means that it's useful. You can learn something. Something that makes one know one species better to help you understand people. Then Mrs Smith continues. One likes to hear what is going on. To be au fait, which is French for up to date. As to the newest modes of being trifling and silly. So Mrs Smith knows that a lot of gossip is not important. Trifling means unimportant. Silly, of course, just means it's not uh, always valuable. So, but because Mrs. Smith lives in this place, she can't move. This conversation for her is a treat. It's like a present, it's a gift. And response to this by saying, I can easily believe it. Women of that class, like a uh, she's a worker, right? She, uh, Nurse Rook is a worker. She goes to many people's homes. Have great opportunities. And if they are intelligent, may be well worth listening to. This is interesting. We have talked a lot about how this society separates based on class. But here, Anne, who is from the upper class, says that women of the lower class may be worth listening to. This is a very unusual attitude at the time. Why? She continues. Such varieties of human nature as they are in the habit of witnessing. Uh, so here, in the habit of does not mean they have this habit. That doesn't make sense, right? She can't choose whether or not to see what she sees. So this just means she often sees. And it is not merely in its follies, that they are well read. So for they see it occasionally under every circumstance that can be most interesting or affecting. So interesting, you know interesting, but affecting means moving. So Mrs. Smith talks about meeting people and Anne expands this idea to different kinds of situations. And here she gives more examples. People being ardent, which means passionate. Disinterested, which means objective, 客观的. This is not uninterested, 没兴趣的, right? Disinterested is 客观, uninterested is 没兴趣. A lot of people confuse these two words, so it would be a good idea to make sure you keep them clear. Disinterested is not involved. And self-denying attachment. So loving someone, helping someone, not for oneself, but for that person. Also heroism, fortitude, which means strength, patience, resignation, which means 容忍, 接受, 
all the conflicts and all the sacrifices that ennoble us most, that make us noble human beings, that make us people with good character. 给我们就是高尚人格的这些状态. So Anne, being the person that she is, focuses on the important, noble, interesting parts. But Mrs. Smith is not always focused on those good parts. Her reply is, yes, sometimes it may, though I fear its lessons are not often in the elevated style you describe. 所以他意思是说，确实有时候看得到这种高尚的人，但很多时候人并没有那么高尚. Elevated means to become higher. Uh, so according to Mrs. Smith, generally speaking, it is its weakness and not its strength that appears in a sick chamber. It is selfishness and impatience rather than generosity, and fortitude. There is so little real friendship in the world. So, Mrs. Smith argues for the value of this gossip, but we have just seen that to Mrs. Smith, it is more for entertainment and only sometimes for education or spiritual education. 精神教育, 精神鼓励. Whereas for Anne, uh, she mostly thinks about how people can behave wonderfully even when they are suffering. But they both agree that gossip is a good way to learn about other people and therefore to learn more about human nature. Today, we don't really focus on the idea of human nature very much anymore. In our democratic society, we tend to think that different people have different lives and that we should respect differences. So when we say human nature today, what are we talking about? When people can have so different lives, can there still be a single human nature? This is something that's very different from the older society. In the 18th and 19th centuries, England still believed in human nature still believed that they were all one people. Even when there are different classes, upper class and lower class, they all believe in the same religion. They all support the same king and queen, and so they are all very similar. But because no people are exactly the same, if you want to understand your people, you have to understand more about the different ways that your people can live and think and behave. So that is the value of gossip here. Mrs. Smith focuses on the more pessimistic parts of human behavior and focuses on the more optimistic parts, but either way, they both think it is valuable to learn more about people so that you can have a better idea of human nature. I think today we still agree with this idea, even if we don't say the words human nature. We, still, we do still think that the more of life you experience, the more wisdom you have so that when you encounter new situations and new challenges, you have uh, different ways of dealing with these situations. So even we, you don't have to have an idea of a single human nature, but you can still think that it is useful to learn more about other people. So this idea of 
gossip, this positive idea of gossip is very different from the usual negative meaning of gossip. That's why Mrs Smith says you can call it gossip if you will. Right, so like if you have to, if you think it's most accurate, you can use the word gossip to describe this situation, even though it's a negative word. Usually when you think about gossip, you will hear people say, you know, mind your own business. That kind of idea. Um, and it is true that you shouldn't um, jump into other people's business for no reason. But here, Ann and Rook, or sorry, Ann and Mrs. Smith are not talking about intervening in other people's business. They're simply talking about learning and understanding. So that side of gossip could be valuable. Of course, today we also have to pay attention to where the gossip comes from. Maybe the person telling you this thing might be trying to change your mind, might be trying to influence you. But in this story, Nurse Rook is simply sharing news. Uh, so gossip is not always good, but it's not always bad either. Questions about number two? OK, before moving on to question three, I want to show you something. Here. Mrs Smith mentions that Nurse Rook is also nursing Mrs Wallace of Marlborough Buildings. So she's also helping to take care of Mrs Wallace. That name. Wallace, doesn't that name look familiar? Haven't we met someone named Wallace last week? Let's see if we can find him. Colonel Wallace, this is on page 97. In relation to Mr. Elliot, so Colonel Wallace is Mr. Elliot's friend. And Nurse Rook is taking care of Colonel Wallace's wife. Very interesting. And we know that Nurse Rook likes to spread gossip and pass news around. So maybe the story of Mrs. Smith will somehow become connected to the story of Mr. Elliot. Hmm. Well, we will discuss that more next week um, when we see the connection. For now, let's move on to question three, Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot. So far, what we know of Mr. Elliot is he's basically the perfect guy. And yet Anne has some kind of criticism. Let's see what she says, or let's see what she thinks. Mr. Elliot was rational, discreet, polished. So discreet means he he's careful about privacy. Like if someone tells him something, he won't share it with everybody. He's careful about people's privacy. Polished means that he has good manners. Uh, the word polish is cha liang. So to be polished means that ta zuo ren ba mian ling long, basically. But he was not open. There was never any burst of feeling, any warmth of indignation or delight at the evil or good of others. 
So there's never a moment when he reveals a sudden emotion. Warmth here, uh, we mentioned this two weeks ago, is kind of like anger, but not that angry. Ang and being angry is hot, so warmth is almost angry. Here it's used to describe indignation, fen kai, or delight, happiness, at the evil or good. So like if uh, you see or hear something evil, you might feel indignation. When you see or hear something good, you might feel delight. But not Mr. Elliot never expresses these kinds of sudden emotions. This to Anne was a decided imperfection. Decided here means definite, treating the imperfection. Her early impressions were incurable. So her first impressions of Mr. Elliot were here incurable means they were not changed. It's hard to change first impressions. So this is telling us that Anne did not change her mind about Mr. Elliot. It's more that she has observed even more than at first. Mr. Elliot She prized the frank, the open hearted, the eager character beyond all others. So this is the kind of person that she likes. Frank, which means honest, open hearted, and eager, warmth, and enthusiasm did captivate her still. So these ideas of sudden emotions did make her feel like these people are interesting and worth knowing. Captivate is similar to fascinate, Ling Ren Zaomi. She felt that she could so much more depend upon the sincerity of those who sometimes looked or said a careless or a hasty thing than of those whose presence of mind never varied, whose tongue never slipped. So this is a comparison, right? Then. So she feels that people who sometimes make a mistake, a, who, who look or say a careless or hasty thing. Hasty means Anne feels that these people are more sincere, and so she can depend on these people as compared to people who never varied, whose tongue never slipped. Um, for those people, Anne thinks she doesn't know what they really feel, and so she cannot depend on them. Mr. Elliot was too generally agreeable. Uh, Various as were the tempers in her father's house, he pleased them all. So even though the people living with Sir Walter were very different, right? Various were the tempers. Their personalities were very different. And yet Mr. Elliot could please everybody. He endured too well. Stood too well with everybody. So in the eyes of everybody, he was a good person. He had spoken to Anne with some degree of openness about Mrs. Clay. I remember this is Elizabeth's friend had appeared completely to see what Mrs. Clay was about and to hold her in contempt. So when he talked about Mrs. Clay to Anne, he agreed with Anne that Mrs. Clay was up to no good, was maybe trying to marry Sir Walter, and so he held her in contempt. 
and yet Mrs. Clay found him as agreeable as anybody. So even though Mr. Elliot seemed to agree with Anne about Mrs. Clay, and yet the way that he behaves toward Mrs. Clay still pleases her the same that he pleases everybody. So do you think this it makes sense? Do you think that it makes sense for Anne to criticize Mr. Elliot for being too perfect? Is that even a thing? I think it does make sense. First, because I don't believe anybody is perfect. So if Mr. Elliot seems perfect, he must be hiding something. And if it's a big thing, then you know it's a big deal. But if Mr. Elliot is working so hard to hide a small thing, that tells us also something about his person. It tells us that maybe he's also very vain and narcissistic, Yang Han Silian. So that even the smallest thing he is not willing to let anybody know. So whether he's hiding a small thing or a big thing, it is a kind of imperfection to be or to behave too perfectly. Now, Anne says that she values people who, even though they sometimes make a mistake, are sincere and open because she can trust these people. She always understands what sincere people are thinking. I think that also kind of makes sense. The novel gave us the example of how Mr. Elliot behaves toward Mrs. Clay. He says that he agrees with Anne. Mrs. Clay is probably not someone he can trust. But he behaves toward her as well as he behaves toward anyone else. In other words, if he had not told Anne that he agreed with her about Mrs. Clay, then simply judging by his behavior, Anne would think that Mr. Elliot um, valued Mrs. Clay just as he values everybody else. We would not have been able to tell that he had different thoughts about Mrs. Clay. So if Anne had not talked with Mr. Elliot about Mrs. Clay, she would not have been able to trust him regarding Mrs. Clay. In this point, Mr. Elliot would not have been dependable. And that just proves Anne's point. It proves that Anne's logic is correct. You have to have a sense of who a person is before you can know how much to trust the person. Questions about number three? So as I said last week, we don't have solid evidence that Mr. Elliot is hiding anything at the moment. But from the way that the novel describes him and the way that Anne thinks of him and the novel has us agreeing with Anne, it's more and more likely that Mr. Elliot is hiding something. So we can expect that from next week. What is he hiding? Question four. Louisa's fall. So here they are. Uh, Anne is thinking about the fact that Louisa has chosen to marry Captain Benwick. And she thinks it seems quite different from the Louisa that she had originally known. So why? How has she changed? Why has she changed? The day at Lyme. The fall from the cob. The cob is the like the pier that goes out to sea. 就是那个海边的那个码头，它从上面跳下去那个地方. 
might influence her health, her nerves, things and her courage, her character, Weiren, Gushing, to the end of her life. As thoroughly as it appeared to have influenced her fate. Um, and here the idea is that the accident has changed her fate because she was uh, Louisa was forced to stay with Harville and Benwick, and so she had the chance to talk with Benwick and she fell in love with him and they got married. That is how the accident changed her fate. But Anne says that it would it just as the accident changes her fate, it will also have an influence on every other part of her life. Health. Mental health. Courage and personality. Do you agree? Well, yes, I do agree. It was a major accident. And the reason it happened was because she trusted Wentworth to catch her. But Wentworth did not have time to prepare and so was not able to catch her. So it will influence her health, yes, because it was a big accident, but it will also influence her courage. Uh, here it refers to how much she is willing to trust other people. And how um, determined she will be to always do what she wants to do in the future. Remember last week Wentworth said that Louisa was too resolute. She was too determined to jump from the pier. Even before Wentworth was ready. So this accident will probably have some kind of effect on her sense of determination. Her courage. It will also affect her mental health. Um, after any kind of long illness, spending a lot of time recovering in bed, people's mental health changes. Before Louisa was open and active, eager and fashionable. But after spending such a long time recovering, it's likely that she will no longer be so active. Maybe she will grow more introverted. Um, having spent so much time alone by herself in her own mind will change her mental health, will change how her, uh, she thinks. In English, we say it will change her psyche, her mentality. And if her health changes and her mental health changes, her entire person, her character will therefore change. So yes, I do think that this makes sense. Anne may be too brief in talking about this. She only says the accident, but really it's the accident plus the long recovery time plus her marriage to Benwick instead of Wentworth. All of that together will have the accumulated effect of changing her life forever. That's what I think. Maybe you disagree. What do you think about question four? Do you have ideas or questions? OK, um, let's take an early break. Uh, let's take a break for 15 minutes. And when we come back, we'll talk about question five. Question five. Well, we already have a partial answer from a few weeks ago when we looked at the scene where 
Mary tells Anne that Wentworth told Louisa, or I guess Henrietta, that he thought Anne was much changed, that she was a very different person. Uh, and we analyze that moment, even though Anne thinks this means that Wentworth still hates her. We analyze that moment to show how it could also mean that Wentworth still loves her. But at this late moment in the novel, we have more proof. So let's take a look at that. Um, and here they have gathered, um, I think, to go to the opera or some musical performance with Viscountess Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, the two important yet boring nobles. Uh, and Anne has just finished talking with Wentworth. Uh, she was thinking only of the last half hour, and as they passed to their seats, her mind took a hasty range over it. So she went over the last the conversation of the last half hour. Wentworth's choice of subjects, his expressions, and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light. To see in only one light means to only have one interpretation. His opinion of Louisa Musgrove's inferiority, Bururan, an opinion which he had seemed solicitous to give. So he was willing to give this opinion. He didn't wait for her to ask him. He took the initiative and gave it himself. His wonder at Captain Benwick, uh, the fact that Benwick decided to marry Louisa. His feelings as to a first strong attachment. Uh, which means that he thought that it was important to fall in love before marriage. You're right to first have a strong attachment. Attachment means emotional connection. Sentences begun which he could not finish. His half averted eyes to avert means to to avert your eyes means to look away. So his half averted eyes and more than half expressive glance. All, all declared that he had a heart returning to her at least. That anger, resentment, uh, avoidance were no more and that they were succeeded not merely by friendship and regard, regard here means respect, but by the tenderness of the past, each in the one role. Yes, some share of the tenderness of the past. This is kind of funny, right? Uh, when she's thinking about all of this, she gets more and more excited. And at the end, she says, ah, look, he has the tenderness of the past. And then she pauses and takes a step back and says, yes, a little bit of the tenderness of the past. So she realizes that she's getting too excited. She could not contemplate the change as implying less. He must love her. So since she's thinking about this conversation, let's take a look at the conversation. Let's see what happened. Um, here, OK. So here they are talking about the marriage between Benwick and Louisa. And Wentworth says, I confess that I do think there is a disparity. Too great a disparity, and in a point no less essential than mind. 
So there is a disparity in something that is as important as the minds, the two minds of the people getting married. I regard Louisa Musgrove as a very amiable, which means friendly, sweet tempered girl and not deficient in understanding. Uh, doesn't sound like a compliment. To be deficient in means to lack. But Benwick is something more. He is a clever man, a reading man. And I confess that I do consider his attaching himself to her with some surprise. It seems to have been a perfectly spontaneous Zifashingden, untaught feeling on his side, and this surprises me. A man like him in his situation with a heart pierced, wounded, almost broken. Fanny Harville was a very superior creature. Here just means person. And his attachment to her was indeed attachment. A man does not recover from such a devotion of the heart to such a woman. He ought not. He does not. So here Wentworth is saying Louisa is fine, but she's not as good as Fanny and she doesn't fit Benwick. This is huge. This is big news. Remember, everybody thought that he would marry Louisa, but here he's basically admitting that he had no plans to marry her at all. So if he's not attached to Louisa, he is once again single and as we say today on the market. Right, everything he says about Benwick, clever reading, everything he says about Fanny, all of these he says do not apply to Louisa. So this is the first evidence. He doesn't actually love Louisa. Uh, and Anne, of course, is shocked. By this news, she was struck, thinking, gratified, mani, confused, and beginning to breathe very quick and feel a hundred things in a moment. Um, so she changes the subject to his spending time at Lyme. Um, There is another point. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, sorry. No, we already saw it. The other point is when Wentworth says that a man does not recover from such a devotion of the heart to such a woman. He ought not, which means he should not. It's not right. And he does not. He's talking about Benwick and Fanny. But this is no longer just about two people, right? He says a man and such a woman. So he's now talking in terms of generalities, of precepts. So it, it can apply to any two people in a similar situation. Including himself and Anne. This could be describing his own feelings toward Anne. Uh, earlier we saw him compliment Anne on her quick thinking when the accident happened. So he still thinks that Anne is a great woman. 
So according to this logic, he, a man, should not recover from his devotion to such a woman. And if he's not a hypocrite, if he lives like he says he believes, this also tells Anne that he still loves her. Hello. Uh, so this is the conversation that Anne was thinking about. Wentworth says he didn't really love Louisa, and he says a good man should never give up his feelings for a good woman. And earlier he had expressed the idea that Anne is a good woman. So no wonder Anne believes that he must still love her. Uh, there's a push and the pull. 有推力也有拉力, right? 推力就是他其实不是爱着Louisa,拉力就是他还是觉得Anne是一个好女人. So if you put two and two together, you get four. In this case, that Wentworth still loves her. Okay, so that's number five. Do you have questions? Okay, let's go back to the beginning of this week's reading and we will go in more detail. Chapter 17. While Sir Walter and Elizabeth were assiduously pushing their good fortune in Laura Place, assiduously means constantly and carefully, uh, pushing their good fortune, so they want to try to keep up their good fortune, their good luck. In Laura Place, this is the place where Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret live. At the same time, Anne was renewing an acquaintance of a very different description. She had called on her former governess, a governess is an old word for a live-in tutor. So it's a nurse and a tutor. 又是带孩子,然后又是上家教课,的那种女生的职业. So she had called on her former governess, she had visited her former governess. 你们有看过真善美吗? You've seen The Sound of Music? Maria's job is governess. That's the job. Uh, so she visited her former governess and had heard from her of there being an old schoolfellow in Bath who had the two strong claims on her attention of past kindness and present suffering. So this old friend, because she used to be kind to Anne, and because she is currently suffering, these are two good reasons for Anne to pay more attention to her. So there are two strong claims on her attention. A claim on something says that this thing belongs to that person. So here, because of Mrs. Smith's past kindness and present suffering, she has a right to Anne's time and attention. That's what this means. Miss Hamilton, now Mrs. Smith, had shown her kindness, so had shown Anne kindness in one of those periods of her life when it had been most valuable. Anne had gone unhappy to school, grieving for the loss of a mother whom she had dearly loved feeling her separation from home 
and suffering as a girl of 14 of strong sensibility and not high spirits must suffer at such a time. So Anne was unhappy going to school for three reasons. Her mother just died. She's leaving home. At that time, going to school means living at the school. And because she's 14 and so the like, girls of 14 naturally are not very happy. Especially when they have a strong sensibility, which here means that she is uh, has her own values. And no high spirits, Jingsen Buja. So she's unhappy in school. And Miss Hamilton, three years older than herself, but still from her want of near relations and a settled home, remaining another year at school, had been useful and good to her. So Miss Hamilton, Zong Jin Guo, had been useful and good to her. So had been good to Anne and had been useful to Anne. So she helped Anne a lot. Now, what is this big description of Miss Hamilton? This long description. She is three years older than Anne, so Anne was 14. Miss Hamilton was 17. But even though she was older, she remained another year at school because she wanted, which means lacked. She lacked near relations, so she didn't have family members who could take her away from school, and she did not have a settled home. Right, if she doesn't have close family, then she doesn't have a place to call home, and so instead she stayed in school. Already we can tell that Miss Hamilton comes from a different kind of family than Anne. Anne, whose family cares so much about being nobles, and passing down the title of Sir. Whereas Miss Hamilton doesn't have a close family and doesn't have a fixed home. But it doesn't say that she's from a lower class. It might be she's from an upper class family that has fallen from grace, as we say in English. Usually common people don't go to school with nobles. So at, even at the time, Miss Hamilton was not from a happy family, but she helped and took care of Anne in a way which had considerably lessened her misery. Considerably means greatly. Misery means suffering. So Miss Hamilton had helped Anne a lot and, and prevented her from a lot of and, and lessened, weakened her suffering. And could never be remembered with indifference. Indifference is the So every time Anne thinks of Miss Hamilton, it is with good positive feelings. Miss Hamilton had left school had married not long afterwards and was said uh, was said to have married a man of fortune lots of money and this was all that Anne had known of her till now that their governess's account brought her situation forward in a more decided but very different form so their former governess brings Anne news of Miss Hamilton uh, to bring her situation forward in time. So like Anne has now caught up with what happened to Miss Hamilton in a decided, which means definite. So this is uh, news that she can trust, but a very different form. So in the past it was happy memories, but now Miss Hamilton has been suffering. Um, we talked about this sentence. M Mrs. Smith had had difficulties of every sort to contend with. So all kinds of difficulties she had had to 
contend with here means deal with. And in addition to these distresses, she also had uh, rheumatism or arthritis. She had come to Bath on that account, which means for this reason, the reason of the rheumatism, and was now in lodgings near the hot baths. So she doesn't own her place. She rents her place. That's what it means to be in lodging. A lodging is usually where a traveler would stay. Remember Kellynch Lodge, where Lady Russell stays? She rents Kellynch Lodge from Sir Walter. It's a house created for guests and renters. So Mrs. Smith is renting a place near the hot baths, which is why the place is called Bath, Ruotren, Wundren living in a very humble way, not a lot of money, not a lot of resources, can't even afford a servant, not part of society. Their mutual friend, uh, okay, and again, like the hot baths of Bath are said to be able to cure illnesses. So that is why Mrs. Smith is in Bath for her rheumatism. Their mutual friend, the governess, answered for the satisfaction which a visit from Miss Elliot would give Mrs. Smith. Answered for here means guaranteed or promise on someone else's behalf. So the governess promised for Mrs. Smith that a, a visit from Miss Elliot, Anne, a visit from Anne would bring lots of satisfaction. And Anne therefore lost no time in going. She mentioned nothing of what she had heard or what she intended at home. It would excite no proper interest there. Excite here just means uh, bring. It would bring no proper interest. Her family members would not be interested. Or if they were interested, it would not be for the proper reasons. And later in this chapter, we will see that this is true. So instead of saying, oh, that's a good thing to do, please go. Instead of that, Sir Walter will say, she's poor and disabled. Why would you spend time with her? So it's not a proper interest. She only consulted Lady Russell who entered thoroughly into her sentiments, which means she agreed thoroughly with her feelings. To enter into someone's sentiments means to agree with their feelings. Sentiment means feeling. This could be important for the final exam. That sentiment means feelings. And Lady Russell was most happy to convey her, which means take her, as near to Mrs. Smith's lodgings in Westgate buildings as Anne chose to be taken. So Lady Russell not only agrees with Anne, she will take Anne to visit Mrs. Smith. And here it says Mrs. Smith lives in Westgate buildings. And we have already noted that Colonel and Mrs. Wallace live in Marlborough buildings. So buildings means apartments, gong yu. Was his going to such you? So like Kellynch is a great piece of land with houses and a village. But Westgate is just a building or a, a group of buildings. The visit was paid, so she paid her visit. To pay a visit to someone is just means to visit someone. Their acquaintance reestablished. So they once again became friendly. Their interest in each other more than rekindled. To rekindle means to burn again. And it says that their interest is more than rekindled. So it's not just polite. They really became interested again in each other. 
the first 10 minutes had its awkwardness and its emotion. Right, awkward, right? They've been away for so long. They don't really know who the other person is now. Kind of awkward. And the emotion, right? Uh, the emotion of all of the memories of the past and looking around at the present situation, very strong emotions. Wanwanju 小时玩伴，变成长大之后又重逢了，那个关系到底是什么？能不能真的继续维持友谊？就会有一点尴尬，需要稍微摸索一下，就是这种情况。Twelve years were gone since they had parted. Uh, 分道扬镳, they had parted, and each presented a somewhat different person from what the other had imagined. 所以彼此跟想象有略有不同 Twelve years had changed Anne from the blooming, silent, unformed girl of fifteen. So she was blooming, so she was becoming beautiful. Quiet and unformed. Into the elegant little woman of seven and twenty. With every beauty excepting bloom. So she no longer has that becoming beautiful kind of beauty, but she has every other kind of beauty. And with manners as consciously right as they were invariably gentle. So when she was little, she was unformed. Didn't really know how to do the perfect manners thing. But now her manners are consciously right. She tries to have correct manners. And they were also always gentle. Invariably means always. Right? Variable means changing. So invariable, unchanging. Her manners are always gentle. And 12 years had transformed the fine looking, well grown Miss Hamilton in all the glow of health and confidence of superiority. The glow of health, uh, and confidence of superiority. She is older than Anne, so when interacting with Anne, she had that confidence from being older. Uh, remember two weeks ago we talked about Anne and Benwick. She said that even though she was younger than Benwick, but she was older in feeling, so she had that sense of superiority. It's the same logic, but here it is actually older. Not or not just older in feeling. So Miss Hamilton turned from this into now a poor, infirm, which means sick, helpless widow. Receiving the visit of her former protege as a favor. A protege, this is French, is usually someone who learns from someone older. So like uh, you may have heard people say you should try to find a role model. Usually in this relationship, the older person is the role model, and the younger person is called a protege. Someone who learns from a role model, who learns from someone older. 
but not like a teacher and student. A protege is someone who learns from example or informal instruction. Uh, this word is still used today. Sometimes it is simply used to mean follower or disciple. Uh, but remember, it has the specific meaning of a person who learns by observing their role model. So Anne is Miss, uh, Mrs. Smith's former protege. When they were younger, Anne looked up to and learned from Miss Hamilton. But now she was receiving Anne's visit as a favor. So in this relationship, it's very clear. Mrs. Smith cannot move, is suffering. And so when Anne is visiting her, it is an act of kindness. We may even say an act of charity. So it's a favor. Favor today, we usually in Chinese we say right? In English we might say, I owe you a favor. But really in English, it's not just about helping people. It's also about being kind and taking care of people. The word favor originally meant um, a good feeling towards somebody. We still have this meaning in the word favorite. So I right? My favorite person was either in. Oh, Right, the, the key idea is favor. So to do someone a favor originally meant I like you, so I will do something good for you. Doesn't have to be romantic. Uh, and so maybe like this, this good thing will be seen as a kind of gift. And when you receive a gift, you must always find a way to repay the gift. So favor today means helping someone, but in the past it just means doing something good for someone. And so here, Anne's visit to her old friend is considered a favor because her old friend is poor and sick, and there's no reason that Anne should visit Mrs. Smith. It does Anne no good. So it's a kind of charity. So even though they both have changed so much, but all that was uncomfortable in the meeting had soon passed away. Meeting does not mean kaihui. Meeting here means the act or moment of having met someone. So it's related to the verb to meet, gun say So here meeting means had soon passed away and left only the interesting charm of remembering former partialities and talking over old times. Partialities. To be partial to something means to like something, or to be partial to someone means to like someone. So partialities is things that they remember fondly, things that they have good memories of. And then of course they, they talk about old times. Um, we, we talked about this sentence. Next sentence, neither the dissipations of the past nor the restrictions of the present. Uh, and the ending is neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. So nothing has turned Mrs. Smith into a sad person. What are these nothings? Neither the dissipations of the past. So the bad things that have happened in the past. Dissipation to dissipate means to disappear, to dissolve, shaosan. 
So dissipations are when things have dissipated, when things have gone bad. Uh, and it says, and uh, it, this part is stuck in the middle as a kind of explanation. And Mrs. Smith had lived very much in the world. The idea is when you live in the world, it means that you have experienced a lot and you have suffered a lot. Uh, so this is explaining that Mrs. Smith had a lot of dissipations in the past. She had encountered many things. Nor the restrictions of the present. Right, she's sick. She's sitting here, can't move. No money. Restrictions. None of this have ruined her heart or spirit. In the course of a second visit, so when Anne comes back later, Mrs. Smith talked with great openness. And Anne's astonishment increased. She could scarcely imagine a more cheerless situation in itself than Mrs. Smith's. This is the worst possible situation Anne can imagine. Uh, and we talked about how bad it was. We and uh, aside from being sick and not having money, her accommodations, Chu, were limited to a noisy parlor, a shaoketing, and 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 I guess, and a dark bedroom behind. So it's dark, no windows, not a good design, with no possibility of moving from one to the other without assistance. Right? She has rheumatism. She can't move by herself. So even moving from the bedroom to the living room and the living room to the bedroom, she needs the help of someone else. Notice the word for living room is parlor. Um, in Kellynch Hall, in Anne's home, we used the word drawing room. Both of these are what today we would call a living room. Keting or hui ke si. A parlor is smaller. The word parlor comes from French. It means to talk. So a parlor is where you would bring your guests and you would talk to them in this place. And we mentioned last time the word drawing room. Draw means not to like make an image. To draw means to bring. So again, a drawing room is where you would bring your guests. So even in the place where she lives, Mrs. Smith cannot move by herself without assistance. And as for this assistance, there was only one servant in the house to afford. Afford here means to give this assistance. So she's living in like a two bedroom um, place. And she never quitted the house, but to be conveyed into the warm bath. To quit the house means to leave the house. So the only time she leaves this house is to go to the hot springs of this city. Yet in spite of all this, Anne had reason to believe that she had moments only of languor and depression, two hours of occupation and enjoyment. So Anne thinks she has good reason to believe, which means that Mrs. Smith didn't tell her, but judging from the situation, Anne believes that in Mrs. Smith's current life, 
the linger, which means melancholy or boredom or sadness. Sorry, linger means boredom. Depression means melancholy, which is sadness. Moment in her boredom and sadness, she had only moments. But in occupation, which means having something to do and enjoyment, she had hours. So this sentence in Chinese would be. And you Leo Runway. Mrs. Smith, the Sijian Sang. And of course, this is incredibly strange because of how much Mrs. Smith is currently suffering. So she says, How could it be? She watched, observed, reflected. Reflected means thinking. Uh, right today we say we you please write some reflections. Xie So reflecting means to think. And finally, determined. not just fortitude or resignation. Why not only these two? A submissive spirit. 愿意屈服的精神, might be patient. So this is resignation. A strong understanding would supply resolution. This is fortitude. So if Mrs. Smith had a submissive spirit and a strong understanding, she would have patience and resolution, strength. But here was something more, not just submission and understanding. Here was that elasticity of mind. Elasticity means flexibility, 弹性. That disposition to be comforted. That power of turning readily from evil to good. So as we mentioned, life always has good and bad. And Mrs. Smith apparently has the power to always turn from the bad to the good. And of finding employment, which means something to do, which carried her out of herself. All of these good attributes was something more than what nature alone could give someone. Therefore, it must be the choicest gift of heaven. So the fact that Mrs. Smith had all of these wonderful attributes that could keep her happy is not just from nature, it is from God. And Anne viewed her friend as one of those instances in which by a merciful appointment, it seems designed to counterbalance almost every other want. So instance means example, Merciful means kind. Appointment here means fate. Appoint means zhiding. So this is what has been appointed for Mrs. Smith. This is 命运指派给她的下场. So it's fate. Counterbalance, 平衡. Want means lack, 缺乏的东西. So this sentence in plain English means and saw Mrs. Smith as the kind of person who fate helped to balance out every kind of suffering. And how did fate do this? By giving her these attributes, by making her this kind of person. Tian 
非常不幸的遭遇，心里可以平衡。所有他现生活中缺乏的东西，心里都能够平衡过来，因为他的个性使然。There had been a time, Mrs. Smith told her, when her spirits had nearly failed. 曾经有一度心情没有那么，呃，乐观。She could not call herself an invalid now, compared with her state on first reaching Bath. 刚到来的时候更糟。Then she had indeed been a pitiable object. 当时确实真的很可怜。Pitiable, 值得怜悯的。Object here just means, uh, an object for the pity. 确实是一个怜悯、值得投射的标的。就值得对他怜悯了，就是很可怜了。For she had caught cold on the journey, 路上感冒 ，and had hardly taken possession of her lodgings before she was again confined to her bed and suffering under severe and constant pain. 她才刚搬进来，立刻就要躺在床下不能动，因为感冒，然后遭受各种严重而持续的疼痛。And all this among strangers, 没有朋友家人可以照顾她 With the absolute necessity of having a regular nurse. 这情况之下，一定要有自己 Regular means, uh, fixed times, 时刻固定的 So, in other words, she can't use the same nurse as everybody else. The nurse must have a certain schedule for her use. And so she has to pay for it, but she, her finances at that moment, 她的金钱状况 were particularly unfit to meet any extraordinary expense. So she needs to pay for a regular nurse, but she didn't have didn't have the money. So it was much worse in the beginning. She had weathered it, however, to weather the storm. 就是熬过煎熬，撑过暴风雨 ，and could truly say that it had done her good. 对她好，有成长。It had increased her comforts by making her feel herself to be in good hands. 啊，这件事情撑过去了，让她觉得上天怜悯，因此让她得到了一些慰藉。To be in good hands, 有人好好照顾，但这边没有人照顾她，所以只能是她觉得上天照顾。She had seen too much of the world to expect sudden or disinterested attachment anywhere. So disinterested attachment means somebody cares for you for no personal reason, for no selfish reason. But her illness had proved to her that her landlady had a character to preserve. So in her 生病这段期间，她的房东太太就是确实好为人正直，有帮忙。And would not use her ill, 不会欺负她。To use someone ill, 欺负人。This is how Anne thinks that Wentworth thinks of her. Anne thinks that Wentworth thinks that Anne had used Wentworth ill. You know, Anne 觉得 Wentworth 觉得 Anne 欺负了 Wentworth. And then, of course, she had been fortunate in finding a nurse who was a sister of her landlady, 就是那个 Nurse Rook. 所以就不用付那么多钱，因为她本来就住在这里 ，always had a home. In that house, when unemployed, so Nurse Rook 不用付钱，她本来就住这边，没事就会来照顾她。Let's stop here. Do you have questions so far? Okay. Good. Then before next week, please finish the novel. Bum bum bum. See you next week.